going to go ahead and tell you that we're going to be in the, in the book of John this morning. Chapters 5 and chapters 8. We'll go into that in just a little bit here, but it's kind of funny. It's always funny when somebody says, well, what do you reckon the preacher's going to preach on this morning? And I was watching this episode of Andy Griffith. It's kind of funny. He says, uh, Barney fell asleep. And uh, when they went outside, Andy told the preacher, he said, boy, I have a good service this morning. Barney looks at him and says, yeah, that's one subject you just can't talk enough about, <laughs> sin. And uh, Andy looks at him as they walked out, and he said, he didn't talk about sin. He said, oh, that's just what they assume, is that we're going to talk about sin. If you came assuming that this morning, you assumed right, because uh, we're definitely going to talk about it. Um, and I'm going to throw myself under the bus a little bit this morning, too, and that's all right. I believe that any person of God is to be transparent when they speak about the Word. And I hope that uh, you'll get that out of the message this morning. And I would ask for your prayers this morning as we dig into God's Word this morning. Uh, so this message hit me, and it's kind of odd. Uh, this, uh, this message actually hit me uh, in the shower. Apparently that's where I get most of my messages. And I don't know if it's because I'm trying to clean off all the dirt of the world, I guess that's what it is, but it's just like God speaks to me clearly. I always come out of the shower, the first thing I do is tell Christy, boy, God give me something good in there. <laughs> and it ain't old spice or any of that stuff that I've got on me. It's His Word. I like that. So, uh, But in the news lately, we've heard so much about Christian principles and Christian values and about how that just doesn't mean much anymore talk about that a little bit today. I keep hearing uh, self-proclaimed Christians. We've got people out here that call themselves Christians, uh, and I won't uh, say that they are or they aren't, but they proclaim to be Christians, but yet they call other Christians out in the media today, and they say that we don't agree with your Christian principles. Uh, just one example, there's a singer out uh, that was on tour, and she was on tour, and in the middle of her set, she stopped, and uh, she said, uh, the vice president's wife, Karen, has taken a job at a Christian school. And uh, she took a jab at her, and she said, why in the world would she take that job? Do you know what that school stands for? They won't allow gay students, and they have to sign a letter that supports a marriage union between a man and a woman. And apparently, that was not something that we should celebrate as Christians. It was, matter of fact, it was what divided them from the rest of the world. Imagine that. That we don't call sin, sin anymore. Amen. What we say is that sin is just acceptable. Mm -hmm. It's just a part of life. We're all sinners, right? We can all admit that. Even me standing up here today, I can admit that I'm a sinner. But that doesn't mean it has to be acceptable. And it doesn't mean that we should just succumb to it. God didn't come but to fulfill the law and to save us from that very thing. So why do we deem it as acceptable today? I want to talk about that. And she actually said that since she took the job, she was the worst representation of what a Christian is today. The worst representation. What we have is a war among ourselves. Because we have one Christian saying that another one is horrible because she's standing for her beliefs, which I thought were all of our beliefs. Amen. Amen. But apparently that's not so anymore. And while Jesus weeps at that, Satan sits back and laughs because he's doing exactly what he was called to do, which was to divide us and destroy us we don't have to worry about the world destroying us today. We have to worry about each other destroying each other. We're eating our own young, as they say. Sad, sad day. And we know that Satan doesn't want us united. We know that. We know that he's the author of confusions, and her comments did just that. They confused and they divided. They didn't do anything to unify Christians. Nothing at all. And of course, some will tell you today that Jesus gave us one commandment to 
to love one another as he loves us. Absolutely he did. Absolutely he did. But folks, we're taking that out of context today. We've completely taken Jesus' own words and we've distorted them to fit our culture today. And what I mean by that is that we have basically said that sinful behavior should be supported. How does that make us Christians and how does that separate us from the world? We're called to be separate from the world right. today. Right. How does that separate us if we're in support of it? Amen. So, I've got family like that. I have family that uh, deals with uh, things that we see acceptable out in the world today. And that's okay because I don't have to love their sin. I just have to love the person. And that's the whole, that's the key to it all right there. Is that we don't have to love what they're doing. We just have to love them. Yeah. Right where they are. Right. That's the key today. And Jesus looks at it quite the same way. How do we know that? Well, he doesn't, he doesn't support our sin. He admonishes it. Two cases in point. So if we look in John chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And we'll stop right there. Three words that are so, so important because they tie directly into our salvation and what we are today. That man had an infirmity just like we've all had at one point in our life, that infirmity is sin. Sin is a sickness. It doesn't matter how long we've had it. I had it for 16 years of my life. I had that. I was a slave to that. And when Jesus saved me, that's what he said to me, rise up. And then he said, sin no more. Sin no more. Now, he, Jesus is not implying that you're not going to sin again. We are all called to repent on a daily basis to turn away from the sin that we have in our lives. He didn't know. He knew that we weren't going to be able to achieve perfection. He knew that. But he didn't call us to live in it. He called us to turn away from it. Now I want you, if you will, to go over to John chapter 8 with me and we'll start in verse 1 there. Then they all went 
home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard him began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. And we'll stop there. Both of these instances that we see, Jesus told that person to sin no more. And yet here we have it today where it's acceptable to sin and we can continue to live in that sin because that's what society says is acceptable. But Jesus himself didn't give us that commandment. While he said we're to love one another, he also gave us that commandment, to sin no more. And if we are to sin no more, we can't condone sin, we have to admonish sin. And by admonishing that sin, you're truly loving the person because that's what Jesus did. So when we say we want to love one another as Jesus loves us, that's how Jesus loves us, by turning us away from our sin. He doesn't call us to live in it or to call it acceptable. Jesus never did that. There's not one point in the Bible that you ever see Jesus accept sin. He admonishes it time and time again. Now, both of those stories have very different circumstances. Talking about circumstances, right? Each and every person has a different set of circumstances in which they sin. Amen. A very different set of circumstances. But your circumstances don't have to determine your salvation. In other words, it doesn't matter what you're going through. You can still turn away from that and still have the same salvation that the ones that sit in this house have. You can have that. As long as you are turning away from that sin. I'm going to talk about that. Because when Jesus found the man in the temple, and we see that in John 5, 14, he says, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. He's not necessarily admonishing him in that moment. He is loving on him. How is he loving him? He's telling him, look, you've got a new chance at life. Walk away from what you lived out in the world. Walk away from it. Because it was that sinful decision that you made in your life that put you in the very spot you were in. I gave you a new life. I gave to bring you a new life. And because of that, we have to turn away. We can't applaud in today, which is what we aim to do. You see all these groups out here, these communities. I hate seeing that out in the world today. And that's a harsh, harsh word for me to use. Hey, but I do. Jesus doesn't approve of that. Yeah, let's applaud sin. Can you imagine in New York where these people sat down to sign a law that actually allowed a baby to be aborted on the day of its birth? They yelled, they hooped, and they hollered, and they applauded. The two words in the Bible with the shortest verse, Jesus wept. I have to believe that his tears flowed on that day. That while they sat there and cheered for such evil, 
for the taking of a life. Which is the very fundamental thing that Jesus came to give us. Life. And while he sat, while they sat there and cheered, I have to believe that Jesus wept. Because they made sin acceptable. As a matter of fact, they took man's law and distorted it into something that should be acceptable everywhere, according to them. They lit up landmarks to applaud themselves for making such a law. Can you believe that? As a matter of fact, One World Trade Center was lit. We're talking about a place where three or 4,000 people lost their lives. And isn't it ironic that we would take a place like that and celebrate murder again? And yet we see that as acceptable today. People find that acceptable. Sorry. But you've missed the mark there. You've missed the mark of what Jesus came to do for us. So let's continue to talk about that. It's clear Jesus knew what had caused the lame man's condition. He knew. Jesus knows. Don't think that you're fooling yourself or fooling the world out here. You may be. You may fool your brother sitting next to you. You're not fooling God. You're not fooling Jesus. You're not fooling Him at all. He knows every thought. You might as well speak the truth to Him because He already knows what's on your lips before you speak it. Amen. So you might as well speak it loud because He already knows. Don't think you're fooling Him. That's not happening today. All we're doing, folks, is we're fooling ourselves. We're fooling each other. And as long as we continue to do that, the only thing that we're going to have is division. And Jesus didn't call us to do that either, to divide each other. No. Now, we don't know what the man's affliction was, but the context does imply it was made by sinful choices. And that's exactly what Jesus told him. He warned him. You've been given a second chance. You should make better choices. In order to make better choices, when you accept salvation, you repent. Repent means to turn away. It's that simple. You don't want to use the word repent today because people say, ah, oh, repent. Uh, that's, a, that's an old school word. I don't like hearing that. No, because it's a convicting word. And people don't want to be convicted in church anymore. People don't want to be convicted out in the world anymore. What people want is just to feel good, come in, praise God, and yeah, he's great. Yes, he is. But boy, if you think you can celebrate him while you're still committing your sin life, you're so dead off the mark that it's not funny. You're fooling yourself, though. You're not fooling him. Amen. Let's get that straight. If the man returned to that sinful behavior, He's backslid. He's wasted an opportunity that Jesus has given him to live whole and forgiven. Then you look over in chapter 8 in the book of John and you see the woman who's been caught in adultery. She's been caught in it. She's guilty. She's guilty. And the woman's accusers brought her before Jesus expecting him to pronounce judgment. Because isn't that what we do a lot of times today? We judge. We judge. Look at that person. I can't believe that they live like that. I'll tell you what. We're no better than the scribes and Pharisees out here that brought that woman before Jesus himself. That makes us no better. And that we can't love people like Jesus if that's what we're doing today. I've been convicted of that myself. Even in preparing for this message, I was convicted of that. I'm like, I mean, Holy Spirit just hit me and was like, are you doing that too? Are you condemning? Or do you love? Well, let's talk about that. He told them, Jesus himself said, the one who's without sin should throw the first stone. And as that crowd left, Jesus told that woman, what? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He didn't condemn the woman. By condemning her, that's not loving. That's not loving. But his refusal to condemn her 
was not an invitation for him to condone her sin or to minimize it. Because we can't do that either. We can't minimize their sin and we can't condone their sin. We can't do that with our own sin. We still have to repent for it. We can't minimize what we do in sin either. You tell a little white lie out here, that's not going to matter much, right? And, or, or we take, or we look at that or we say, well, I, I took a dollar from so and so, but that was just a dollar. Okay. Well, think about it like this. What if that dollar was the last dollar that that person had and you took it? That's not loving. That's not loving. And it's still sin. Is it not? It's still sin. It's the, so basically what we're saying is, is that sin is sin. So don't confuse one for another. Don't say that your sin is so small that somebody else's great sin is greater than that. No, it's not. No, it's not. And that's where we get divided today. That's where we find the divide today. Because we're confusing one sin for another. Those are two very different circumstances right there. But Jesus didn't condemn either one of them. He instead just said simply, go and sin no more. So when we turn to Christ and receive his forgiveness, we expect a heart change. And we experience that. Luke 9, 23 says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Deny themselves. In other words, what I do doesn't matter. I have to die to myself. And you don't die to yourself one time. What does he say to do there? Daily. Daily and follow me. And that's what we're called to do. Each and every day, as much as Jesus' love and grace and mercy is renewed each and every morning, should be our desire and our obedience to pick up our cross and follow Him and deny ourselves. Because we forget one thing. Forgiveness is not cheap. It's not cheap. And it doesn't excuse the sin that separated us from God to begin with. It costs God everything to offer us the cleansing that pronounces us righteous before Him. It costs God everything. Well, how do you know that? Well, let's look at the most recognized Bible verse in the world, and I think that we forget it sometimes. It's become so ingrained into our minds that we just file it in the back. So let's bring it to the front for just a minute and talk about it. John 3, 16 clearly said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He gave His Son as a sacrifice for me and for you. It cost Him everything. And it costs us nothing. And do we forget that today? I feel we need to be reminded of that because the power of that verse is demonstrated as the greatest act of love the world's ever known. And yet how often do we forget that today? And we can't experience the transforming power of love and forgiveness without being forever changed can't do that. And I'm not talking about from the outside in. I'm talking about from the inside out. Just like us as, as a church family here, we get changed when we come into God's house. But then we see what happens outside. Well, if we're transformed while we're in here studying and digging into God's Word, it is our duty to go out beyond these four walls. And to transform what's out there. Amen. Because we've been transformed in here. We have to go out and transform what's out there. That's our job. That's our calling. Each and every one of us. It doesn't have to be just the man that stands up in the pulpit on Sundays. As a matter of fact, it's not up to that man at all. Each and every one of us have a calling on our lives. And it may not be to do what I'm doing this morning. But I guarantee 
guarantee you, you can reach just as many people as what any preacher can. It's all about opportunity. And it's all about how we talk about love. And not condemn it. Now it goes without saying that the woman that was caught in adultery didn't return to her infidelity. She did. She turned away. She turned away. She didn't go back to that life. Why? She had experienced that heart change. She had experienced that. The Holy Spirit had taken over her. And she was changed from the inside out. So she went out and lived that new life. Okay? She wouldn't be perfect, but she was forever changed. Her eyes had been opened to the depravity of what she was doing. Depraved, that's a word we hear a lot today. Depraved and different, right? We hear that a lot. Depravity, or to deprive, means to take something away. If you deprive a child of their video games, or you deprive anyone of anything, if you deprive an alcoholic of a, of a beer, you know, that's, they consider that depraved. You've taken it away. But no, in other words, she knew what she was doing. But she wanted to get rid of that. She wanted to take it away. And because of that heart change she had experienced, she did just that. She had it removed. I want God to deprive me of the things that keep me from getting closer to Him. If depraved is a bad word, let's not look at it like that. I want to be deprived of anything that separates me from him. But sin no longer held the appeal that it did. Now see, when we meet Jesus, sin no longer holds a fatal attraction. When I say fatal attraction, sin does one thing. It ensures death. We all are going to meet that. Sin ensures death. It does. But it only has to mean one death. Because if we die to ourselves and we die out in the world, we're eventually going to, to die, right? Not just look at it like from a, from a belief standpoint, but we are going to die. Because sin was brought into the world, we're ensured of that. The wages of sin is death, right? Yeah. But when we're born again, the power of the Holy Spirit breaks that power that sin wants. Have we hear that, that he's a chain breaker? So the, the bondage that we've experienced, I, I compare it to somebody in a straitjacket. If you're still living in a straitjacket, guess what? You can't be the hands of Jesus because you can't extend a hand, right? So if you're bound by that sin, you can't help one another. You're bound. You're bound. You're bound up. But guess what? If he breaks that chain, I got my hands. I can extend my hand to Brother Tom. I can extend my hand to Sister Sherry. Anybody out in the world, I can extend that hand. I can be his hand. And we're called to do that. Romans 6.6 6 tells us, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. In other words, it's almost like Romans 6.6 6 is telling us that we were crucified right along with him. He didn't necessarily take our place. We joined him up there. If we truly accept his word, and that allows us to join him again one day. As he sits at the right hand of the Father, we still have the ability to go to him. Now once we lived only to please ourselves, but when we've been forgiven, that motivation changes. You're not motivated by the things of the world anymore. You're motivated for one thing and one thing only, and that's to please God. That's your motivation. If that's not your motivation in life, we need to examine ourselves. We all need to examine ourselves. And say, so what is my motivation for getting up today? What is my motivation? I do that every morning. I get up and look in the mirror. And as I'm looking in the mirror, I, what I'd like to see is Jesus looking back at me. Not my own reflection. But if he lives within me, that's what I want to see. Is him looking back. 
Have we ever shopped like the Bible thing? Now we talk about gangs and we talk about abortionists and we talk about the gay community and even women's equality and even civil rights. Well, let's look at that for a minute because Dr. King was a great motivator for the civil rights movement. But if you think that Dr. King only wanted equality for his own race, you'd be dead wrong. You'd be dead wrong. And how do we know that? Well, Dr. King was a wonderful minister and a man of God himself. And that was the call that he took most serious in his life. As a matter of fact, he said once, if one is truly devoted to the religion of Jesus, that person will seek to rid the earth of social evils. The gospel is social as well as personal. I love that. Because what he meant was is that we're all meant to share it together even though it's a close personal relationship. And we are. But when he talks about ridding the world of social evils, what he meant was he didn't mean just whites hating blacks and blacks hating whites. He didn't mean that at all. Or women hating men and men hating women. He didn't mean that. What he meant was is that anything that separated us as a body from God, that's what he meant. That's a deep statement what he said. But we should seek to rid the world of social evils because these social evils is what's dividing us today. If you really look at it today, we have, well, like I said, these communities out here that stand on the corner and they say if we can't love the person uh, if we hate their sin or their actions. That's what they tell us. That's what they talk about. And that's fine. They don't have Jesus yet. If you don't have Jesus, I don't expect you to know about his teachings. And I don't expect you to know how to follow them if you've not experienced that. We should. And we shouldn't expect it. We just have to meet that person right where they are. And we have to know how to love them. We have to help them find the love of Jesus. They don't know how yet. It's all about how we find it. We help them find it for themselves. And that is how we unify each other. That's how we all come under one umbrella. Nothing can be farther from the truth when, when they say that, though. That, well, if you don't love my lifestyle, then you don't love me. Or if you don't like the fact that I'm a born baby, then you don't love me. No, that's not true. Well, how do you know that? How do you know that, preacher? How can you say that? I'll give you an example. And here's what I guess I'm really trying to say. Anytime you put any cause above the cause for Christ, in other words, you've exalted something up above him. You're walking a tightrope. And you're walking a tightrope of idolatry. And Jesus did give us many commandments, but God gave us commandments too. And Jesus is God, and God is Jesus. We know that. What was the first thing that God said to us? There shall be no other gods before me. And yet Satan has found a way to do that in the world today. These people who stand up and clap for abortion, they don't know about the love of God. If they did, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't murder somebody. That's like these people that go out and they clamor for these refugees, but yet we've got homeless veterans sitting right here, starving in a tent under the bridge. But yet we're divided in that because they want to please this group of people and we want to please this group of people. You see, there's a divide. There is a divide. But God didn't do this. God didn't divide us. God didn't even separate us from him. We did that. Man did that. We separated ourselves from God. What God did was give us a way back to Him. It cost God everything. It didn't cost us anything. It doesn't cost you anything to sin today. Today. But it'll cost you dearly if you die and you haven't repented or turned away from that. It'll cost you everything. 
And that's what we don't talk about enough about today. But, we, but we're teetering on idolatry with all of these groups today. Because they put the cause of themselves or their lifestyle or their beliefs and their choices above God. That's the problem. So how do we fix that? How do we fix that? Well, you might think that I'm judging there, and that's fair. So, I'm going to put myself on the old sin block. Okay? I want you to imagine for just a minute, you didn't know me at all. You've never met me. And I came in here for the first time to preach today. If you looked at me and you didn't know me, at nearly 400 pounds, I've seen it out in the world. I've been judged for it a million times. Matter of fact, when people don't want to hear what I have to say, not what I have to say, when people don't want to hear what the Word of God says, because that's what I preach about. I don't preach about my beliefs. I preach the Word of God. I speak for Him. I don't speak for myself. I've denied myself. I have taken up his cause. I don't speak for me anymore. It's not about me. If you're listening, if you came in here to listen to what Brother Ramsey has to say, you're going to get failed. If at some point in your life, you're going to get failed. But if you came to hear what Brother Ramsey has to say about the Word of God, infallible, perfect, perfect Word of God. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> I've had people that look at me. I've had people actually even on social media. Well, how can you talk about that when, when gluttony is obviously the, the deadly sin that you deal with? You know, I've heard that. Big man, big man. Think God's pleased with you? Actually, no. No, I don't. I don't. You know why? Because it's a temple he loaned me. And I've made bad choices in my life that put me in this position today, that actually put my legs in such a bad shape that it's even hard to walk upstairs nowadays. But you know what? It's his mercy and it's his grace and it is the fact that I want to turn away from that that allows me to be approved unto him to do his work. But our sin should never define who we are. It should never define us. There should be no such thing as any community except the body of Christ. That's it. We're all one. We're all together in this. I say it right now. You all are my brothers and sisters in Christ. You are family to me. Why? Because we're all going to inherit the kingdom of God together. It's an inheritance for us all. Because the ransom has already been paid. And we don't see that enough today. So it doesn't matter what I'm saying is, if you're a black man, that should define who you are, that you're a black man. If you're a woman out here today, it should define you that you're a woman. I'm a fat man. I stand up here and preach. Guess what? My weight doesn't define who I am. If you're a homosexual out here, it definitely shouldn't define who you are. Because it's sinful. Let's turn away. We don't, I don't want somebody to come to me and say, oh, you're that heavy set guy. I want somebody to come to me and say, hey, you're my brother in Christ. I'm happy to know you. That's what I want. So don't separate yourself from God by defining the person you are by your sin, but rather separate yourself from the world by declaring we can all fall under the umbrella of Christ's belief. There's no greater cause than the cause of Christ. There's nothing greater. Deny yourself and take up your cross. Well, how do we do that? Real easy. We ask Jesus into our hearts. We confess that we're sinners. And that we want to repent and live not for our sin. Or ourselves, But for Christ. And if we'll stand together in Christ... That's what defines us, and that's what will ultimately unite us. Miss Hope, if you